Hello, bonjour, hola, marhaba, ni hao, prebit, namaste, konjiva, and assalamu alaikum. Welcome to our new episode, Two Nations, One Origin, Voices from Sudan and South Sudan. I'm your host, Nabil Abbas. Sudan and South Sudan were once part of the same country, but they have a complicated history together because of deep differences in ethnicity, religion, and economics. The country became independent from the control of Britain and Egypt in 1956. However, there were ongoing flight fights mostly between the Arab majority north and the ethnically mixed, mainly Christian and animist south. After many years of civil war and a lot of discussions, South Sudan became an independent country in 2011, making it to the newest country in the world. This split was very important for both countries, and they still face issues relative to their running governments, developing economics, and building things, even though they share a common past. And in our, this episode, we have a very interesting twist today. We brought two diligent young speakers from both countries. Joining us are Peter Emmanuel Justin from South Sudan, and Noon Muhammad Ali Al Jabli from Sudan. It is a pleasure to have both of you in this podcast today. and to share your insights and personal experiences. Let's let us just interact with both of them. Peter, starting with you, South Sudan is the world's newest nation, a title that comes with unique challenges and opportunities. Could you tell us a bit about yourself and what is like growing up in South Sudan? Um first of all, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you for the chance to be in this podcast. Um as you stated I am called Peter Emmanuel I am a South Sudanese from South Sudan and as you also stated earlier it is the newest country in the whole world and initially it was part of Sudan after it got its its independence we got our independence in 2011 that was after a referendum had been conducted so growing up in South Sudan had been a journey of resilience and hope as you know it is the youngest country and then being young there are different challenges that we might face as a country itself knowing that we are adopting to us ruling ourselves and becoming a country of our own so we face uh difficulties that is to building our national identity and also addressing developmental challenges that we are facing and on a personal perspective it it was quite difficult um sustaining education in south sudan itself is quite difficult knowing that the literacy rate in South Sudan is is quite low that is because most of the places by then when we got the independence were rural areas it's mostly those who are situated in the public that has access to quality education thank you very much peter we are so glad to have you today and of course we, we have a lot of questions to do when we discover more about south sudan i just wanted to ask our other speaker Uh, no moving over to you sudan has a rich history that dates back millennia how has this historical context influenced your upbringing and your perspective on sudan's current state and please let us know about yourself as well uh hello nabila and peter nice to meet you both and thanks uh, for kicker for the opportunity so i'm going to i'm going to start by um introducing myself i'm noor mohammed I am 23 years old. I didn't born in Sudan, but I grew up in my whole life in Sudan. What I would like to say about Sudan and I would like to say about history in Sudan and what growing up in Sudan feels like, it is a lot for me. Um uh, I grew up in a very uh, rich community and a mixed community. I had friends from South Sudan. and i have witnessed or not like witnessed i have seen uh, the the south sudan separation uh in 2012 in 2011 sorry and i have friends from south sudan in school and i have uh, a neighbor who is from south sudan 
He was a family friend. We had a lot of memories with him. Uh, I hope he's doing good right now. And while well, growing up in Sudan in a very uh, rich country, uh, feels like is like it fills me with pride growing up and reading about our history and but also filled me with respect for uh, the resilience of our people uh, for both people South Sudan now like South Sudan and Sudan and uh, who, which is continuing continually till now yani. and also Sudan history is marked with colonization and conflict in war and political instability uh, uh, studying this history and growing up with this history is made me aware of the challenges that face in Sudan today and that face Sudan along the way also. And um, I think that's it. Thank you very much. And this is so lovely to have you there today. And I'm sure our audience is very much, you know, curious to know more about both of these countries. And because both of you share the same origin, almost the same culture and the resilience and you respect that as well. And I believe this is such a wonderful thing that today we have both of you together. And one of the good things about these podcasts by Tactile is that we have genuine speakers, we have the youth and we get give them this platform to speak their part. So further going on to this, you know, very hurtful conversation. I just want to go deep down to the geography and suppression. Peter, South Sudan's geography, with its vast swamps and the Nile running through it, must play a significant role in everyday life and even politics. How do you think this has shaped the nation, especially post suppression? Okay, um, South Sudan's geography itself. It's characterized by extensive swamps and the Nile River. Profoundly, various aspects of life and politics within this nation rely on the geography. Particularly, post-separation from Sudan, there are very many key ways in which the geography had shaped the country. One of it is the resource dependence. The Nile itself is the resource for the country. As a result, we depend on the Nile that is a mean for transportation, for agriculture, for fishing, and providing livelihood for many South Sudanese. However, the, in the, uh, the dependence on these resources also made the country vulnerable to environmental changes and resource disputes. Secondly, the infrastructure challenges. The presence of swamps and poses are significant challenges for infrastructure development. That can include probably um, roads, uh, bridges, and utilities, it's hard for these ones to be built due to the swamps that are available. It affects the connectivity between regions and access to services itself. And also it affects the economic development of the country that is most particularly in remote areas. Um, sadly, the ethnic and regional diet, South Sudan's geography com uh, contributed to the country's diverse ethnic and regional makeups. Um, different communities have different different historical aspects or specific geographical features and substances that they rely on. And thus it leads to cultural practices and identity. It can both enrich the nation's social fabric and it imposes at the same time challenges for governance and national building. Last B on the political power dynamics, the cultural of a strategic geographic truth can influence political dynamics within the country. Well, because there are competition, uh, there are competition for control over these areas, it fuels conflicts and it shapes, it, at the same time, it shapes political alliances affecting the government structures and decision making. Besides that, also South Sudan is blessed with, uh, it is rich in oil. It has oil in it. As a result, the oil that is in South Sudan is partly shared with Sudan. And at the same time, it is the key form or the key aspect that provides uh, economy, the, the main source of the economy in the country. So as a result, with the current situation in Sudan, 
It blocked uh, the accessibility to the oil. As a result, the economical infrastructure of the country is so poor and it makes it so hard for the country to, to generate itself economically. And also on external relations, um, South Sudan is a landlocked country. Wow, this is so and, amazing. Like we are coming with a lot of facts. And uh, I mean, uh, and once again, I think to our audience, South Sudan is the top of the town, town and they just are more curious to know about it. To her, this question is again to you. Like the suppression in 2011 was a momental event. Can you shed light on what led to South Sudan deciding to become an independent nation? And how has this decision impacted its people? And if you remember any incident from your life you want to share during that, uh, you know, events as well in 2011? Um, well, um, the separation, when it happened, it happened, as I told you earlier, South Sudan got its independence in 2011. So majority, what led to the separation are uh, political related issues more than um, the social aspect of it. Because um, by then, South Sudan and Sudan were one country and then they live in the same place under the same government, which is based in Sudan, in Khartoum. And South Sudan was, uh, Juba is part of Sudan itself. South Sudan is part of Sudan. So politically, um, the two parties decided to part ways. So probably um, what could have led uh, is the, apart from the political aspect, also the social aspect, the Sudanese people were mostly at the northern side and then the South Sudanese are at the southern side. So there were differences in between their cultures a little bit, although the differences might not be so much, a little slight differences between the two cultures, the South Sudanese culture and the Sudanese uh, culture. It's quite different and also some religious differences. Sudan is an Arabian country and South Sudan is not an Islamic country. So these are some of the reasons that had led um, to the separations beyond the political reasons that had foiled in between the two countries. Oh, well, this is very interesting to know that you have mentioned Sudan is an Arab country and South Sudan is not. So would you like to mention that what the religion majority they follow in South Sudan? Um, majority, South Sudanese are Christians. Although we have Muslims, we have people who follow the Islamic religion, but mostly South Sudanese are Christians. They follow the Christian religion. That is great. And I'm sure that our audience is getting a lot of information about both of these countries and their suppression and the effects being had and that of the nation as well. And I believe once again, Capital is a very authentic platform which allows youth to speak not about their countries but about their own lives as well, that what how they are spending their lives in respective countries. So moving further, uh, we just wanted to know more about uh, their you know life culture in both of the countries. So turning to both of you, let us talk about youth in your countries. No, this is for you, like. How do you young people in Sudan find their way amidst the economic and political challenge? Uh, okay, how do young people in Sudan find their way? I'm going to start with uh, the childhood phase in Sudan. Uh, children in Sudan uh been doing a lot of social activities and academic and entertainment activities, like uh, the one that we are so famous of and very known in Sudan and South Sudan, we shared this, that playing with clay and playing traditional games like hide and seek. And we got, we had a, we had a game called Chilel Weno or where is Chilel actually. And what uh, these games in your childhood uh, really impress your mind and play the mind of the children to face the actual life when they grow up in Sudan and to deal with different types of society, uh, to have the confidence to go to open society, for example. And uh, also we had a religious activity like Khalwa, mainly in holidays, in summer holidays, uh, when we read and know about Quran and also due to having uh, the beautiful uh, river in the world, 
So we also go go to the beach and the farms. We say farms and beach because Sudan is so famous with river irrigation. And uh, so you find farms uh, next to every beach in Sudan. Uh, the river from us, the Blue Nile, is less than two kilometers from my house back in Sudan. I was living in a countryside, so that's why. And this is uh, really make you uh, learn about agriculture in your country and have that connection with your country and with with the nature of your country. Wow, this is so great to know, like such a lovely and beautiful life you have in Sudan and such a such are beautiful activities you have mentioned. And of course, uh, Nile River is one of the famous river in the world and people have urged to visit that as well. And we, like you are lucky to have it in your site. Uh, which we also just wanted to know about uh, South Sudan as well from Peter you like how is the normal life of young people in South Sudan but of course the main question like what are the biggest challenges and opportunities facing the youth of South Sudan today um thank you thank you so much for for this question and then let me let me go systematically systematically I'll start with the first question um, which is how does it feel uh, growing up in South Sudan? Well, as we stated, both stated earlier, um, Sudan and South Sudan were both the same country. So we share a lot of things in common. Um, most of the games uh, that Noon had mentioned is also what we do play in South Sudan because we do share a lot of things in common. There are a lot of similarities. We play hide and seek. We play football. We play with the mud. Um, we even like uh, we invent houses. So it's just like an everyday life of any young person in Sudan is the same as an everyday life for a person in South Sudan. Cause we do share a lot of things in common being the same country. And then we having uh, people like South Sudanese who stays in Sudan and Sudanese who stays in South Sudan. So these cultures are being taken in between the two countries. And on the challenges, the main challenge that uh, the youth Youth in South Sudan are facing. First of all, is the primary access to quality education. Um, educational system in South Sudan, although uh, I can't say that they give a hundred percent quality education, educational system is quite poor. This is due to South Sudan being a new nation and having a lot of rural areas that found it difficult to access quality education. So it becomes a challenge that growing up as a youth in South Sudan, especially if you're not centered in the capital city, it will be hard for you to access quality education. And eventually, after getting that education, the second biggest challenge is job opportunities. Um, there are a limited number of job opportunities in South Sudan. As a result, you find most of the youth are impacting on free labor, um, like working to find their ways, like doing small, small business or casual businesses to provide for them, for themselves, because they find it so hard to find job opportunities in the country. And however, uh, these challenges, it had helped somehow in developing some youth in creative thinking. As a result, many youth had decided to come up with job opportunities that can provide for other people. So they don't only rely on the government to provide them with jobs, but they became, uh, they create job uh, jobs for themselves. That is them impacting on their entrepreneurship skills and creating jobs for other people to come in. And this way, we will all have a better future and a better South Sudan. Thank you. Yeah, this is a very probable answer, like uh, mentioning some of the core challenges, uh, accessibility of quality education, and even access to basic education is also a problem and the employment issues as well. I hope we together as a global citizen should work together in these hard circumstances and to foster more, you know, solution as a group uh, towards these challenges. Uh, just want to dive more into culture and heritage and to make our conversation a little more, you know, light. Uh, cultural heritage is deeply embedded in both of your nations. Noon, could you describe a cultural tradition from Sudan that is particularly meaningful to you? 
so a lot of people know Sudanese by uh, by mainly wedding because of the way that how dressed in Dirtik, uh, which is a cultural a cultural tradition in in wedding in Sudan. But we had a lot of uh, other cultural uh, cultural traditions that we do enjoy in Sudan. Some of it is religious, like the Bol Said, Said al Fitr and al Adha. And we had also, uh, we celebrate Prophet birthday. Uh, we call we we call it Molid in Sudan. It the festival goes about a week long, and it is very special to me, and maybe to every Sudan Sudanese uh, person who grew up in Sudan, because. Uh, it, we as children used to have candies, a doll like candies. You have to have a doll like candies, and it's uh, we in Sudan makes a lot of uh, different types of candies on molid, and also uh, a social cultural tradition in Sudan, uh, like wedding and funeral. We do. Uh, we do get big in funeral, wallah. And even in the funeral oration, like after one year uh, of the funeral or two years, we do also make a little festival. It's not like a joyful festival with songs and, and stuff, but it is a some kind of um, uh, an event. Let's see. And also we have national culture, uh, national cultural uh, tradition, in Independence Day, in the first of January, uh, we we celebrate it along with the New Year's Eve, and all those, all those tradition, all those events for me is meaningful and and important for me because uh, I grew up in Sudan and I've witnessed every festival or every event of those. And we we make it special by the way that we celebrate it, and by the way that we make food in those special events, and uh, comes comes along with a special foods and stuff. And also, I almost forgot uh, we had uh, we 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 are so known of Madih, which is a prophet's compliment in a melody. Uh, I don't know how to say it in English, but uh, and we, that's it, maybe. Uh, Medih, why, the, I wanted to mention Medih because a lot of people may see on YouTube the way that Sudanese do it, and we are so special in doing it. Uh, that's it. Maybe that the the very uh, or the most traditional event that close to my my heart is Eid al Adha, the Adha Eid, uh, because. It it gets big, so big in Sudan because and and the holiday in the work and and the school was so was so big. Like maybe sometimes it's a month long, so uh, all the family gathers and it is so special. Wow, such a beautiful traditions and events you have mentioned, and it looks like Sudan is celebrating everything in their life. And this is like very, you know, uh, telling a lot of, uh, telling us a lot about Sudan and their lives and the people. Okay, that's great. So it is a wonderful suggestion from noon to our audience that you should go on YouTube and check that Mati and listen that wonderful, you know, what we can say that poem or lyrics in the praise of prophet. So I'm sure our audience will also love it. So. Thank you very much, you know, sharing all these wonderful events and cultural norms you, you have in your blood as well. Uh, turning turning it over to Peter, uh, like, same question is to you. Is there a South Sudanese tradition that holds special significance in your lives and some of the, you know, core cultural norms you would like to share with our audience from South Sudan? Thank you. Thank you so much, Nebila. Um, thank you, Noon, for elaborating. Thing. It, it feels like uh, I will just I'll, I'll, I'm going to repeat what uh, what Noon had said because I'm just, I, a little bit of what we do also celebrate in South Sudan. Um, there, although although um, we have 
religious celebrations or religious events. They are also political ones. So on the political aspect, we celebrate our country's Independence Day. That is on the 9th of July. That is the anniversary of the independence. The independence, people come to the streets, people celebrate loud music because it is actually a public. Sudanese had taken it of a significance because it is the time when we came out with our own identity as South Sudanese other than Sudanese. And also, um, we do celebrate uh, uh, the Mother's Day. We do celebrate Mother's Day. We do celebrate World Labor Day. These are some of the public holidays that we do celebrate in South Sudan. Say we have Muslims, but both, we have both Muslims and Christians in South Sudan. So we celebrate. Uh, recently, we had celebrated the Eid at Fetter. Uh, I don't know if I had pronounced it the right way. Um, we had celebrated that, and then we will also be celebrating the Eid Adha. And on the Christian religion, we had celebrated Easter, and we will celebrate um, Christmas soon. And there are other celebrations that uh, the church carry on, whether it being the Christian denomination or the Islamic denomination, they do carry on throughout the year. But what I had mentioned are the significant ones that are widely celebrated by almost everyone in the country. Because um, in South Sudan, we are of diverse religions. As a result, when it is Eid al-Fitr, it is not only the Muslims that celebrate, even Christians do join them in celebrations. The same thing uh, when it comes to Christmas, even Muslims do join in celebrations. And South uh, in South Sudan, in even Sudan, there is a tradition whereby when it is eat, people do make uh, cakes. We call it habis. So whenever a visitor comes home, like uh, when it's time for eat, when it's time for Christmas, that is when uh, people are allowed, like you can move in freely each and every home, even for strangers, and then they serve you the cakes, they serve you drinks. So people are generous and then we don't only celebrate that um, because I'm a Muslim, I won't celebrate Eid al uh Christmas. And because I'm a Christian, I won't celebrate Eid al -Sitr. We share each and everything together, regardless of our denominations. And on the cultural perspective, um, South Sudan is blessed with diverse tribes from different angles. And so each and every tribe has its own traditions that they follow. But But then... One thing that is practically known for South Sudanese is the cattle keeping or the cattle comes or South Sudanese being obsessed with cattle keeping, a brand identity of South Sudan. People people know South Sudan. Whenever they see cattle, they know that this is South Sudanese or this is from South Sudan. So we had created this and we had used this, this as a form to show our identity and it shows who we are deeply and because um, South Sudanese are so much into traditions that in weddings, we do have, first of all, the traditional wedding. And in the traditional wedding is whereby like uh, the marriage arrangements are being done in the traditional way. And after that, that's when the final blessing will be held. So the traditional weddings always comes in first and it differs from each tribe to another. As a result, like uh, if you attend today from this tribe, tomorrow you go to another one, you see you're experiencing different cultures. So every culture hold them so dearly and it holds their tradition so dearly to themselves. Thank you. Wow, this is so rich for to hear more about events and tradition in South Sudan as well. And it looks like like both Sudan and South Sudan have a lot of, you know, food to eat and different cultures to celebrate and events to uh, enjoy in their lives. And of course, our audience is also loving the way you, both of you are telling the, you know, daily routine life of youth in both of these countries and the culture. And of course, our audience would love to visit someday both of the countries if they get the opportunity. Uh, diving into the history of conflicts again. Uh, Street frequently moors are future conflicts. Noon, could you provide us with an overview of the origins of the of these conflicts in Sudan, the key developments over time, and the impact on the people involved? So I'm going to start uh, talking about the conflict that happened right now in Sudan by describing the day that uh, all this started on 15 of April 2023. 
uh, it was Saturday. Some of us has work and some of us didn't work. I was in at home, but my sister was at work and my brother was at uh, the market. He, uh, uh, my sister came home safely. Alhamdulillah, my my two two of my brother has to run to to her workplace and get her home safely. But my brother has tra- has been uh, uh, what what's called has been in Omdurman. He ha- he locked he he locked there. He has been locked there because of the situation because the the house house the road uh, was a road uh, because of the roads was locked. And we uh, see on the t- uh, on the TV that the, there is a conflict or war between uh, the Sudan armed forces the military of Sudan and the South and the rabid support forces, the RSF, we were, we were surprised all the Sudanese people or most of them were surprised because those two, two, uh, those two, uh, those two sides were, were actually allies. And, uh, I, I was living in the countryside, so I didn't hear, we didn't hear the bombing and the shelling, but we see on t- in TV first in the morning on that day. And uh, the key development in this war over time is that uh, those people have reached uh, every, every, every site in Khartoum state. And uh, on 15 of December in 2023, the same year, they attacked the RSF attacked Medani, and a lot of people uh, was already uh, forcibly displaced in Medani from Khartoum. They were being the, the, there were the, the people that being involved, and also uh, uh, most of the people that actually uh, involved or actually affected by this war is the people of Darfur state. And because there were ethnic cleansing in Darfur, about ten thousand people, ten thousand to fifteen thousand people killed were killed in the in the past year in two thousand twenty three, and also uh, a lot of people, like I've said, uh, has forced the uh, displaced outside and inside of Sudan, about over uh, eight point two million people. Uh, about 1.8 million people fled the country and the 6.6 uh, million people internally displaced in the 18 Sudan in eight, across the 18 Sudan states and uh, mainly Al Jazeera state uh, this is so uh, nice to have you today once again because you are the youth and you are the peace ambassador as well and a representative of Sudan and the way you are sharing all these facts and information with our audience can help them to understand more about the violence and conflict happening in Sudan. And we can say like the own people are fighting with their own people. And this is really surprising, like the way you also have shown your uh, concerns, the way you told that how your brother and sister just escaped this incident as well. So I wish that we as a global citizen together shall have a very deep concern about it as well and to work together towards peace and prosperity. Thank you very much once again for sharing all these facts with the audience. Uh, I just want to ask to Peter, like South Sudan has had its share of strife, especially post-independence. What do you think are the root causes of these conflicts and is there a and is there a path to lasting peace? And also we want to know that whether South Sudan is also in current conflict or violence. Okay. Um, once again, thank you. Thank you for this question. Um, let me go straight for it. Uh, post-independent South Sudan had experienced two civil wars that had happened. Um, the first civil war was on in 2013. It was in December. Um, that was when the first civil war started. It was after the president had relieved the vice president from his position as the vice president. So it came in, uh, the main cause of the disruption or the violence was basically a struggle for power between the relieved vice president 
and then the president. As a result, um, the vice president was in the same party with the president, but after the fallout, there was a creation of a new party, a new political party, which is South Sudan, uh, which is the Sudan's People Liberation Movement in opposition. Initially, it was Sudan's People Liberation Movement, but after the fallout, the vice president, uh, the, the one which had been released, decided to create another party and made it in opposition to the main government. So it leads to it led to a conflict that happened in the country. Many people got displaced. Um because mainly the fight was it started within the capital city which which is Juba before it extended to other other parts of the country. And by then I personally I was in Juba and after the incident my family and others left the town like i had to we, we me and my family we had to go to uganda and there are others that had also gone to other parts of the country just cause of the the situation that was happening or the fight that had happened so it went on although it didn't take uh the the fight didn't stay for long the it stayed for some few weeks it stopped and then people got back um, we came back from uganda because i was studying in south sudan i'm not studying in uganda so we came back and resumed everything um things went on peacefully not until in 2016 when the two parties sat and agreed to sign a peace agreement and then the party which is in opposition came back into city and joined forces it happened uh that was in june 2016 i was i was in class we were at school actually when it initially happened we we don't know what happened initially at first because um we were at school so we don't know what is happening after school we just had gunshots and bombs and stuff so we had to leave school and rush back home so coming back knowing it came to notice that this is the same reason which is um the struggle for power struggle for power itself and then deeply it came also being rooted with uh ethnical differences whereby ethnic uh, ethnic communities are supporting where their pipelines. So beyond it being only related to political agenda, which is um, the struggle for power, it is also currently annexed with ethnical differences between communities itself. As a result, many people became displaced. Um, there are places actually in South Sudan, as we speak now, that has no people staying in it. People is scattered, and there are many who are in refugee camps in Uganda, in Kenya, different parts of Africa. In Sudan, there were people before the incident that had happened. So people fled from the country, and itself after the fight, it affected the economic, the economical structure of the country. Because um, the moment a country goes through conflict or goes through a series of conflict, immediately it affects directly the economic instability of the country. So as a result, um, although currently there is no war, um, they had signed a transitional government of national unity, and then the the in opposition gov- uh, party, and then the party in government itself, they are all within the city. That was after they came into signing a peace agreement, which they are following up to date, and there is a proposed election this year as per the uh, transitional government of national unity, and we are looking forward for this election. So currently there is no one in South Sudan. People are in a peaceful situation, although those who are in the refugee camps, majority haven't yet returned back to the country. This is due to fear that something might happen again, or the same scenario that happened in 2016 or in 2013 might happen again. But we hope that um, people will get back to the country and everything will be back to normal. And the only challenge we are facing as a country right now is the economical instability. Having gotten out from a fight and we being a country that rely mostly on the oil and with the fight that had disrupted in Sudan, it worsens the economy of the country. As a result, the country is in, the, the economy is being, had been jeopardized. It is so weak that um, the value of the national currency had dropped in the international market. As we speak right now, a hundred dollars values almost two hundred thousand South Sudanese pounds, which affect directly everything in the market and standard of living becomes high. That people majority find it hard to maintain or to live according to the as per a standard citizen in the country. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Peter, for being so brave and authentic to speak about your country and to delve more into the uh, origin of conflict and the historical backgrounds. I believe that our audience is uh, getting a clear idea about both of these countries and the origin of the conflict and why they got, got separated. I just wanted to have a very conclusion statement. Uh, and, I, and I want both of you, like any one of you, if want to correct me. So it is like because of the ethnicity and religion differences mainly, both of the countries decided to get apart from each other. And now they have successfully uh, get apart from each other. But currently in the conflict state, whether both of these countries are fighting with each other or it is because they have inside conflicts, like the gang violence inside of their own countries. And it has nothing to do with each other yeah. so yeah, right. it, yeah actually it, the situation now in sudan the conflict or the war uh now in sudan it has nothing to do with south sudan and it's not like your own military that uh, our, our own military that uh who uh, who is attacking us the rsf is who is attacking civilians in sudan this is the major problem in Sudan that the, the civilian, the Sudanese people, the civilian people are being attacked, are being targeted uh, for the RSF. And uh, I, what I say to you that we are surprised because the RSF was going to be part of the military. There is there was a saying that it, it was going to be part of military and they're not and they never uh, actually uh beside Darfur they were being attacking people in Darfur but uh in 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 Khartoum or in all the state the other state of Sudan they are not attacking anybody they are actually defined to us as military no they were not attacking you that's that's what i'm saying but the situation in Sudan now war in Sudan has nothing to do with South Sudan it's completely internal that is great. That is very, you know, brave and authentic of you. And I think this clears very much to our audience as well that currently Sudan has one of the major insight, you know, matters and violence and conflicts going on. And thank you very much for clarifying that as well. Uh, the RSF and the army things that these two are two different things and how people have, uh, you know, been reacting on this as well. So the same question goes to you, Peter. Do you think like currently the conflicts are the violence, if may happening in South Sudan, has to do anything with Sudan? Um, no, uh, there is, it has nothing to do with Sudan um, because it is a struggle of power within South Sudan itself, within two parties in South Sudan. So it has nothing to do with Sudan. It is an internal fight, which is an internal conflict between South Sudanese that has nothing to do with Sudan. That is great. So I think that was a major point upon which a lot of our public and audience have misunderstandings and like in uh, on different social media platforms as well, youth has gone, you know, misunderstood about Sudan and South Sudan and they think that currently both of these countries are in conflict with each other. But of course, by today through this platform and through this podcast episode, they will get a more clear idea about those those two countries and their you know historical events and the current challenges as well. And most of the time, because uh, both of these countries have their own internal core matters, matters and sensitivities happening within their own countries. And I believe this is a very, you know, good information to other young leaders as well, if they may want to help out in any ways. So the true information and the true facts are always coming from the same youth who is uh, living in the same countries are the big youths, are the survivors, because they can better tell us about the circumstances and tell us better about what kind of help need they are looking forward to the world as well. Thank you very much once again for opening up about such, you know, facts and uh, truths. Uh, moving forward to the current challenges to both of these countries, every country faces its unique set of challenges. You know, what would you say is the biggest challenge challenge uh, faced by Sudan right now? And how you would like to mention the world towards these challenges as well? 
So a lot of actually challenges are facing Sudan right now. Uh, uh, according to the UN, uh, 25 million of uh, f uh, people in Sudan are fa are uh, in uh, 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 in needs of humanitarian humanitarian assistance, and the most biggest challenges that face Sudan right now is famine, because um, and because 17 or more than uh, let's not talk about a lot about numbers. But more than one third of the whole Sudan population is facing acute food, food insecurities, and uh, four point nine million of them are in the in the brink of uh, of a famine. And uh, also, uh, this is because of the a lot of a lot of factors actually because of the war of the conflict, and because of the people. Uh, forcibly displaced in uh, to to states that the states actually doesn't have that uh, health or uh, food services that is going on right now. Or it's before the war the states doesn't have that much of the capacity to hold the uh, this number of people and. Also, the the ex expansion, like I said before, of the of the fighting in December, uh, uh, into central and uh, and uh, and and to central and eastern Sudan, mainly Al Jazeera state, the country uh, most placed with internally displaced people, uh, was the one factor of increase in the humanitarian uh, needs, and also. One of the challenges that one of the big challenges that faces right now is a disease outbreak, because uh, like cholera and uh, measles and malaria and dead fever, uh, because like I said before, the states doesn't have good health services even before war, and also because of the insecurity and the displacement, the crowded, uh, the crowded, uh, the, how crowded the the states become after war and to the limit access of the medications and the lack of medical supplies, uh, the lack of electricity as well and water. Um, and also uh, what is what's actually challenging, challenging in Sudan right now that the both side side does does not agreed on a on a on a on a human AIDS line. So so there is uh, actually, and and also right now is uh, the connection problem. So uh, very very few uh, organization or uh, international organization can reach actually the people in Sudan and can reach the the region of the conflict like Khartoum because Khartoum is uh, is not is not safe at all because of it, there is still bombing and shelling in Khartoum and in, in Al Jazeera as well. So, and also uh, one of the challenges uh, is the education. Uh, the education of maybe a whole generation is a stop right now and the lack of the clear vision of the of when, when the country will continue, uh, the education is not, uh, is not clear. So, uh, that's it. And also, the conflict has damaged the country's industrial base, education, and as, I, as I've said, uh, health facilities and uh, this, this collapse uh, of economic activity uh, with the impacts of the food insecurities and forced uh, displacement has led to uh, economic, it has led economic to shrink uh, for about uh, 12 percentage in the past year. I cannot say uh, this is all the bad challenges that face Sudan, but most of the people in Sudan ad have uh, are adapting. Uh, a lot of people in states open their homes to displaced people, and also uh, a lot of youth uh, uh, have started a youth association in the states and to 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 like uh to educate children mainly and 
for women empowerment and uh, have started a low cost house uh, health uh, a low cost health services but also a lot of these people uh, uh did their their youth association did their their activity in al jazeera state and like i've said before they attacked the al jazeera state after the people have settled like uh, they maybe like uh, settled I cannot settle with a big word. I cannot say settled. They are almost settled, let's say. So this is challenges, education, economic, and the actual uh, the actual the actual challenges in Sudan right now, which which I wanted the world to to actually look at is the the problem of or the challenges or the pro or the the famine actually in Sudan. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noon, once again, um, like sharing all these facts and the current challenges and the most press, you know, attention to the world. And I'm sure our audience and our youth is listening to you a while. And I would request them to share this episode as much as we can so that we can have both of these countries with the right, uh, you know, uh, access to the right help and aid at the moment. Uh, I just wanted to ask Peter as well, like, uh, what do you say in South Sudan? Like, what is the most pressing issue that needs attention right now? Um, okay, thank you. Um, South Sudan had see, ha is having series of challenges um, besides the political instability and then the political agenda. Um, first of all, um, more than 70% of South Sudanese or yeah, more than 70% of South Sudanese are illiterate. And then the 30%, not all 30% is having access to quality education. So illiteracy becomes a problem. Remember a country with high rate of illiteracy, immediately it becomes a problem. Knowing that education can make a country run so smoothly and it makes a lot of things easier. But it happens that South Sudan, um, the rate of literacy is so high compared to the rate of literacy, making things quite difficult for the country itself. And secondly, um, the unemployment, they are inadequate or limited supply or limited available chances of employment. That is basically um, to the youth, because um, I am speaking on a youth uh, point of view. I'm not speaking on, on like a general point of view, but regardless, even on a general point of view, employment is a problem. There are inadequate employment opportunities that have been provided. And as a result, um, although there are chances, most of these chances or most of these offices have been taken by foreigners. Most of the people that are working in South Sudan are foreigners. And then people kind of have a tendency of believing in foreign resources or in foreign manpower more than the South Sudanese manpower. People tend to think like um, people who are foreign or from the other countries are having more skills than the people who are in the country or people who are within the country itself. So employment becomes a problem. I remember once there is no employment being provided, it increases the number of crimes. It increases the, uh, the insecurity rate because people tend to maintain a living out of nowhere. And this is where most of the youth embark into crimes, embark into drugs and a lot of things. So. If we look into the challenges, maybe let's say into the crimes or the drug abuse and stuff, they are quite related with lack of employment opportunities and also illiteracy. Because um, a person who's literate will know what he or she is doing or what he or she is embarking himself into. Thirdly, the economic instability. As I earlier stated, post independence or after the conflicts, the economy of the country had jeopardized. So currently, the economy is so weak that. To maintain a living is so hard. And then what a civil servant earns as a salary is hard, like per month, can't even run a one week activities at home. So you find that like um, after you receive your salary per month, it ends up finishing in a week or two. And then the other two weeks, you will have to find a way to sustain a living. That is because the economy is so down and what is being provided is so less and can't really sustain enough for the services or for what you want to eat on a daily basis. Also, um, as Moon had said, health on the health sector, health had been an issue. 
there are some spaces or some places in South Sudan that has no access to quality health services. Quality health services, I mean quality hospitals with good personnel. Most of the rural areas in South Sudan are having uh, the primary health care units which are situated in it. Although there are some conditions that really might uh, require a high specialist or a good hospital or a good health sector to cater for them. As a result, we find it so difficult for people in the rural areas to attain health services. And even those who are in town to attain like quality health services, it is expensive. So if we check, most of these are so related. Um, the health services, it becomes expensive to sustain that is due to the economic instability in the country. And then the more expensive it is, the more it affects the health structure of the people in the country. Also, um, the, the weather changes, the climatical changes, this is a global agenda that is affecting each and every country, not only South Sudan. The global, uh, the climatic changes is affecting each country all over the world. As a result, it had affected the seasons and then there is drought and famine in the country. Like, um, as we're speaking currently, the temperatures go up to 40 degrees. And then normally by this time of the year, this is when it should be rainy season when people will be experiencing series of rain. But then since January up to date, um, then number of, uh, of times we experience rain is so less and we are already in April and already concluding April, we're going to March. So, uh, we're going to May. So we expect, um, previously by now, this is the rainy season and people will be mostly inside because it is raining almost daily. So the climatical changes is affecting as a result, it affects even the agricultural activities and there is famine and drought in the country. Also, um, there is no enough, uh, opportunities for youth to venture into entrepreneurship. As I earlier stated, I said some youth ventured into entrepreneurship, but then not majority can make uh, their concept or their startups to the final to the final note because there is uh, like uh, the number of support that is being provided is less. People are not being supported with lots of entrepreneurship skills, like to invest more in entrepreneurship. So as a result, because there is no access to external resources or there is no access to external help or external opportunities, I might have. A startup plan and then I can't take it to the next level because I don't have the resources to do that. Not having the resources comes into lack of employment and lack of chances being offered to sustain or to start this startup plan that I had said. So generally all these are uh, all these challenges that we are facing this uh what I had mentioned are some of the few challenges that we are facing that is more especially from the youth point of view. And then there are other challenges which are minor challenges and can be solved. That is, if these main ones had been solved, because it solved itself automatically as this uh, these challenges we are facing get solved. But then if we look into the most important one is the rate of illiteracy. If we manage to decrease it and then there is higher rate of literacy in the country, it will eliminate a lot of issues in the country. And then also looking into the unemployment if there are chances being provided for local citizens or for South Sudanese citizens, it will reduce the risk of crime because most people will be engaged and people will be working. So people will not be having time to engage in crimes and others. So the moment we, we engage into providing employment opportunities for the nationals and the youth specifically, the youth itself. So everything would be possible. But right now we have youth that had graduated almost five years ago and they haven't gotten any job to sustain a living with. So they're just living on a day-to-day -day basis or day-to-day -day jobs that you get and earn immediately to sustain a living. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing all these facts and statistics and the challenges faced by South Sudan as well. And of course, like both of the countries are struggling in terms of their political, uh, economic and, uh, you know, social economic situation as well. And you have also mentioned about uh, some of the events regarding youth in drugs and crime. And I believe this is one of the, you know, major and important issue of, uh, faced by today's youth as well. So it was like an important issue to mention as well. Thank you very much for being brave about it as well. Um, like we have heard in the news, 
South Sudan is going to have its uh, forthcoming election. Is it true? And like, what are the youth expectations then? If you would like to briefly tell us. Um, yes, it's it's true. South Sudan will be having its. Uh, actually, this is the first election that we are having ever since we attained our independence from Sudan. So um, it was initially scheduled for 2023, and then it got rescheduled for 2024. And currently, um, people are looking forward to election because the government had announced there will be election in December this year, which is months ahead. So the youth are waiting because this is the time when we, we really have, we really wish to have our voices heard and we really wish to have people or youth out there that will represent us and push the youth agenda into the government. Remember, the youth in a country are the main aspects or the main sources or the backbone of the country itself. So the moment the youth had been supported and backed up, everything goes smoothly and their voices are heard. So definitely, this is what we're expecting. We are waiting for their election with an expectation that, that there will be change in whatsoever is happening because all of us are aiming for change, whether being changed on our mindset and other aspects in life. We as the youth, we are hoping that the forthcoming election is the startup. Like it is a startup of the new South Sudan that we want and the South Sudan that we wish to live in. Because um, each and everyone out there is not wishing to have their forthcoming generation to live in the South Sudan we are living in currently. We all want to come in and bring other generations to live in the South Sudan that we want, a peaceful South Sudan, an educated South Sudan, a South Sudan with lots of chances, and a South Sudan with zero hunger and zero famine in its up. So for this to happen, it comes out like after the election, we really wish that our voices are heard and then we put much effort in pushing the youth's agenda after the election. This is what the youth is hoping. We are hoping for a good leadership that will come in and lead the country to the right path. Thank you very much. As we are moving to the end of this podcast, uh, I would like to both of you to, uh, you know, send your final message to the world. No, we will start from you. Like, what is your final message to the world, to the youth around this world and what you want them to learn more about Sudan? So, uh, what, what I would like, what I would want to say to the world, I would really urge the international community not to forget, uh, about the people in Sudan and additional resources are urgently required to support the humanitarian, uh, uh the humanitarian needs in Sudan. And what, what would I like for people and listeners to know about Sudan is, or to like, they didn't know it before. So now I will tell you that Sudan, every state in Sudan uh, has his, its its unique culture or its culture, its different culture, but they all merge in Khartoum. Like you can see in Khartoum, there is a culture that that um, uh, holds a lot of differences in it because every state in Sudan merge in Khartoum. And also in our history, we are a very peaceful nation. Even if, uh, if people or the world see in our culture, there is a little bit of violence or what we call, yes, violence. Uh, but we take our independence, uh, through, through peaceful, peaceful activities. And also, uh, if you know the language of Sudan of or if you know the delicate of Sudan, we are so uh, what we call dry and we also uh, communicate in dry way, but we are so, when, we, when you see in our song and in our culture, we are so romantic and we're so, uh, uh, go uh, what is called romantic and like, you know, a uh, peaceful people, like cute people, let me see, let me say, yeah, and cute people, a lot of people in Sudan doesn't like to be called cute, but we're cute. And, um, and also, uh, one thing that I want, uh, other people to know about Sudan that we almost have a uh, social classes, like we are a society without social classes. You can see, uh, different social classes sitting in one place in Sudan or in every, in, in, in in the whole Sudan, 
we are so famous with tea sellers. Uh, they were in the street and they were spread it widely in Sudan. In every, you can see it even um, inside the uni, inside the university, and inside the uh, the works facilities. Uh, so in the tea sellers, a lot of people that just um, uh, communicate with each other and uh, like you can see, there's almost uh, a society without a social classes in it. And I really hope uh, for my country to have uh, that. I, I, I really like to see my country uh, after years. I, I really like to see my country thrive, sorry, after years and united, after years of challenges and war, where every Sudanese citizen can thrive and fulfill their uh, their potential. And I really hope for South Sudan also to strive, inshallah, and to these elections goes uh, very well and to be a good place for youth and for every uh, South Sudan uh, citizen. Thank you very much, Don, for such a wonderful message to the world, to the rest of the youth across the world, across the borders, and I'm sure our lovely audience, our delicate youth across the world is listening to you today and, of course, uh, they had a lot of clear idea about both of these countries and they are loving, of course, about both of the Sudan and South Sudan. And your message reveals a lot about the current issues as well as the culture and the way you have uh, intellectually asked the people to give the right aid to the right people at the current situation. Uh, I just wanted to uh, turn over to Peter as well. We would like you to, uh, you know, tell us your final message to the uh, rest of the world. And what would you like to the youth of the world to learn more about South Sudan as a final message? Um, thank you so much. Uh, my final message to the global world is one thing I, I would like to tell the world that South Sudan is now an independent country. This is first of all and it is different from Sudan. There had been series of misconception between the two countries and people still thinking that Sudan and South Sudan is the same or it is one single country. But I would like to highlight that um, South Sudan is a different country from Sudan, although we share a lot of a lot of things in common, but now South Sudan is a different country and then Sudan is a different country. And secondly, uh, I also wish that the world understands that despite the challenges that we are facing in South Sudan, despite all these challenges that is being portrayed on media and on television, on news and everywhere worldwide, uh, South Sudan is a nation with of immense potential. It is a nation that is rich with cultures. It is a nation that is rich with tradition. It is a nation that the, it is also rich with resources and spirit of nations, like of one nation of unity. So our story as, as South Sudanese, it's not only about the conflict. It is not only about uh, insecurity. It is not only about hunger or poverty. Um, our stories, it includes our culture. We are rich in cultures. South Sudan itself, it is so rich in culture that we do respect our cultures. And then we have a strong desire for peace and resilience and prosperity. This is one one thing that each and every South Sudanese is wishing to have. So we wish that the whole world understands this complex and understand that once they do come into this understanding that we South Sudanese, we are beyond what is being portrayed on media, beyond the conflict, beyond the insecurity, beyond everything, they will, they will really understand that as a country, we are rooting up for their support. We need support. We need people to back us up as we embark into this journey. Because South Sudan itself is a beautiful place to be around. It is a wonderful space. And it is a country that uh, I wish each and everyone should come and experience. Because um, one thing, the South Sudan on ground or the South Sudan we are living in currently is not the South Sudan that is being portrayed on media or being portrayed on news. It happened that many people that came to South Sudan, they were shocked with what they had seen compared to what they have had in the news. So I hope uh, 
people really get the chance to come into South Sudan and experience the South Sudan that we are living in. And then people should go past the conflict that is being portrayed, past the conflict, past every challenge that is being portrayed that South Sudan is facing. Beyond the challenges, there is a, a, a sweet part of being a South Sudanese. And there is a sweet part that South Sudan is a wonderful country. South Sudan is blessed. South Sudan is diverse. And everyone would really love to be in South Sudan. So one thing I would also want people to remember is we are rich in culture, as I earlier stated. So if you come to South Sudan, you will experience all the cultures that we're having. Um, besides uh, the more than one culture, we have our own cult uh, traditional cultural beliefs and the traditional way of life. That is, that's, it starts from the wedding, the funeral rites, uh, the way of life, living and everything. So it is so rich in culture that from every uh, community to the other, it differs. And even as South Sudanese, we don't know like all the cultures in general, but we are learning. And this is where the beauty comes in. You go to this community, you learn this culture. You go to the other one, you learn this culture. So once you come into South Sudan, you learn a series of cultures that you don't really know about South Sudan. And this is what I'm hoping for people to know. First of all, to know that it is a different country, the world's youngest nation. And it's uh, it's now different from Sudan. It is not the same. Secondly, it is a beautiful country beyond what is being portrayed on the news and the media. Thank you. Thank you very much. Such a, such a lovely and strong message to spread it on the world. And I would like to pick the lines when you said that the South Sudan is not all about conflict. It is beyond conflict. It has a rich culture. It has rich tourism as well. So, and of course, you have greatly mentioned about the uh, media propaganda as well. So, very brave of you. Very, you know, authentic and genuine of you. And once again, I am really thankful to both of you because through your eyes today, we have seen both of these countries and we have learned about the differences but despite of these differences both of these countries are unit and they share you know culture together and they have huge respect for each other and of course the way you both, both of you have clarified the internal you know some of the sensitive ma matters being going on inside of these countries so this like i mean this podcast is very richful uh informative podcast and myself like i'm learning a lot about the word about the word geography i would say so thank you very much once again both of you it's it's, it's been a wonderful you know uh, podcast it, it has been incredibly enlightening to hear your stories and perspectives peter and moon thank you so much for sharing your time and insights with us today we hope today's discussion brings our listeners closer to understanding the unique yet interconnected stories of sudan and south sudan to our listeners, thank you for your time and joining in. We hope this episode has offered you a deeper glimpse into the lives and challenges faced by the people of these two fascinating nations. So join us next time for another engaging discussion on our capital podcast. Goodbye for now and thank you very much to both of our young speakers.